welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, I'll tell you what, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? I'll tell you what, I am. So why do we do this? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. And would you join me in honoring and reverencing the Lord and stand if you're able to as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father God, we come before you in this house, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we get to come into the house of the Lord and to hear your word. Father, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman, Father, to hear from a band or from music, but, but God, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word that you would cause us to have tonight. Father, I thank you that we would leave this place, Lord, with your word sown into good ground as we walk out of these doors. Father, that we would be effective ministers of your gospel as we learn to love our God and love the people around us. Father, I thank you that you would speak to us, that your very presence would be in this place and touch each and every one of us. And I just give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles... Why don't we turn just uh, quickly to our opening scripture, the, the, the foundation scripture, I guess you could say, of our, of our uh, series in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. I was telling the young adults on Friday that I think that this weekend is my Bible's last weekend. James has fallen out. J- John has fallen out. So that's good, though. My Bible's gotten some use. I remember uh, somebody, as a matter of fact, it's in, it's in one of the Bibles that, um, I think Joey wrote it in one of my Bible college Bibles a long time ago, 10 years ago now, that if my Bible's torn apart, my life's not, so hey, great, I'll accept it when my pages start falling out of my word of God, so. But in, uh, well, in Matthew, the, the 22nd chapter, we're talking about loving God, loving people. Matthew 22nd chapter, verses number 37 through 39. Matthew 22, 37 through 39. And here, if you remember, there were some Pharisees that were coming to Jesus to question him after hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. Remember, we talked about this uh, two weeks ago. If you weren't here, you can go online and grab that message for free, or you can grab a CD in the counter. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were two different, uh uh-oh, two different uh, beliefs uh, two different sects of, of Judaism, essentially, where uh, the Pharisees, when they, got, when they heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they said, hey, well, let's go talk to Jesus, the one who silenced the Sadducees, and let's see if we can silence he who silenced those who we oppose so that we could be the better ones. So the Pharisees are coming to Jesus, and they're asking him a question. And it's not necessarily the question that they ask him. It's not necessarily a question that's a, 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 a direct response because depending on what opinion you were holding, uh, they ask, they come to Jesus, and they say, what's the most important law. And uh, depending on some people would say it was the Sabbath, some people would say it was the sacrifice, some people would say it was the circumcision, so forth and so on. So they weren't necessarily questioning Jesus's uh, response or his wittiness to scripture, but rather his judgment to see what is the most important. And as they questioned Jesus, his answer in the 37th verse is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Kind of like that song we sang this, uh, this evening. He says, this is the first and the great commandment, resorting back to Deuteronomy in the Old Testament as the children of Israel were recounting as they were going into the promised land and they were recounting the laws that had been given to them. And the second, he responds in the 39th verse is, like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we're talking about loving God, loving people based on these two scriptures Jesus Christ says the first and the most important commandment is to love God. Last week, Pastor Paul brought a great message. The week before, we kind of touched on, we we, we talked on what it is to love God. I encourage you, if you didn't grab a hold of that, go online, get the message. You need to hear it. You need to understand what it means to love God. If you recall, it won't be up on the overhead because there's just too much of it at this point. To love God is to honor God. We talked about that. To love God is to reverence, to revere, and to fear God. To love God is to submit to God. To love God is to represent as the people of God, to represent God correctly. Last week, Pastor Paul continued on that. To love God is to stay in a relationship with God. It doesn't do much good if you say you love God today, but tomorrow you're doing your own thing and you're in a different relationship with a different God, lowercase g. 
you have to stay in a relationship with God. And he began to pick up as far as to the topic of the subject of to love people is to push past discomfort. When you push past that barrier of discomfort when you're dealing with people, because let me tell you something, I don't know about you, but every once in a while when it comes to dealing with people, there's a certain level of discomfort. I don't know if I'm the only one in here that has ever experienced that, but to push past that discomfort, to, to see what's on the other side of that relationship, to see what's on the other side of reaching beyond yourself to speak to somebody, to talk to somebody, to reach out to somebody and see what God reveals in that relationship through that conversation. Very important. And as we pick up on the subject of loving people, on the overhead, I'll go ahead and put it up, is, is uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, in the ninth verse. Paul the Apostle writes, says, But concerning brotherly love, to love people, to love one another, you have no need that I should write to you. Why is that? For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So when we talk about loving people, we could look and we could say, Oh, well, this message is going to be about how to love people. What, what are the steps in that we should take in order that we should love people? But, you know, just as Paul was talking to the church, I believe, you know what, the Bible tells us enough about how to love people. I think that in general we can think about how to love people just as a mere common sense. How about be nice? How about uh, sacrifice your own thoughts? And, 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 you know, like I was sharing with the young adults on, on Friday night, we have a series called Fatal Attractions and things that draw you away from God. And this, this last Friday night we were talking about the, the words of our mouth. To love people maybe sometimes just means to keep your mouth closed at the right times. There's enough in the Word that we can read about how to love people. But what I want to continue on is that theme of to love God is and continue on that now we're going to change pages and change, uh, turn the corner and just say to love people is. So before each point is to love people. But Paul the Apostle says, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia in the area of which this church is or this group is located. Goes on to say, but we urge you brethren that you increase more and more. So Paul the Apostle says, hey, listen, listen, guys, I don't need to instruct you on how to love people. God, through the word of God, through the writings, through the teachings of Jesus Christ, has already told us a great deal in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament on what we ought to do to love people. And he says, as a matter of fact, you've done a pretty good job at doing that. But he says, don't stop at where you're at, but continually grow, continually step out, continually reach out to the people that are around you to the, to the, in, in their area of Macedonia and to all the world. Relating that to us, church, don't just stop with loving San Bernardino. Let's not just love our city to life, but let's love those all around us wherever we go, whether we're in our city, whether we're on vacation, whether we're around the world. Let's love this world to life, each and every person that we come in contact to. Paul the Apostle says to love them more and more to grow. So never to just stop and say, well, you know, I've reached my limit of love today. I've reached my long suffering with people today. And I know living in the Inland Empire, living in San Bernardino, that probably around 1030 in the morning we hit that, that peak or hit that limit, especially, especially for those of you who make a commute to work on, uh, of any distance, whether it be five minutes to 30 minutes, I'm sure you've probably already reached your level of love by the time you've even got to work. But remember the exhortation of Paul. He says, listen, don't just stop. Once you get on the freeway, don't let one person ruin your day or your example, but rather keep going more and more and more. And you push yourself, you push yourself to draw closer to God, to draw your relationship deeper to God, and as well as to reach out to more and more people and to love them like God has called us to do. You guys with me? So we're talking about loving God, to love God, and to love people. Funny, as a matter of fact, I was looking at this, I thought I'd poke fun at it. I, I don't know where I have it in my Bible. Is I, I grabbed a bulletin. Has anybody seen the bulletin? I don't have the bulletin with me. Oh, here it is. If you grab the bulletin, on the bulletin cover, it says to love God, to love people. Man, the people on that look really easy to love. <laughs> they are all just happy. They're all just smiling. They're all, you know, young and old alike. That's great to love God and love people. Well, how, how easy is that? Man, if I saw those people smiling at me like that, I'd love them too. 
But, you know, not everybody smiles back at us. So love doesn't just go beyond a returning a favor of a smile or a nice gesture. There's something more to, to loving people rather than just to be nice to them, to just, to just smile at them or to wave at them on the freeway when they cut you off. We're going to talk about that today. Are you with me? So we're talking about loving people tonight. To love God, love God, love people. So number one, if you're taking notes tonight, number one, to love people is to love God. Now, we were just talking about to love God. To love God is to honor him, to revere, and to fear him. So now all of a sudden, I want to turn the page on you and to start off first and foremost, when it comes to loving people, to love people is to love God. First, first off, we have to understand that the, the book of Genesis tells us that man was created in the image of God. So right off the bat, we have to understand that we are God's creations. And, and, and God wants us to love the things that he made. Why? Because he loves us. Pa uh, Pastor Powell last week told us that, you know, in, in the book of 1 John, it tells us that we love because he first loved us. To reflect our love to God to others. To spread it beyond just those who we're close to. Just spread it beyond the wife or the husband or the son or the daughter or wherever it might be. But to go about, to go beyond the cities or the borders of our city in San Bernardino to, to love all those that we come into contact with. Remember, when I talked about last, uh, last time I talked about uh, um, to love God was to represent him. Continuing in that thought, now to love people is to love God. Why? Because we are representatives of God and we want to reflect our God, a good, a gracious, a wonderful God who has given us everything that we need in this world, both spiritually and physically. All we have to do is just ask and believe and count on him as faithful to represent him well by loving those who he has not just told us to, not just asked us to, not just said, hey, it ought to be good for you to love people, but commanded us to do. So in following after the commands of our Father, when we love people, we show that we love our God. First John, if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to the book of First John. Have to be careful when turning to First John. The fragile state of my word. First John. Fourth chapter. John is writing here. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. Okay, we're talking about to love people. Right on track. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not Love does not know God, for God is love. So the very three, the, the last three words of that statement, God is love. So if we are to love one another, if we are to reach out and to love people, that shows that we are living in the principles. We are living in what God has ordained us to do, what God has set us to do, what God has called us to do, what God has made us to do which is to love people. Why? Because when we love people, John says that we, it shows that we are born of God. We are in the family. We are adopted. And we have been made that new creation that the Bible says. And also that we know God, to know God, to understand God, to have a relationship like Pastor Paul was talking about, to stay in a relationship with God, to show our love for God because God is love. Are you with me? You know, one of, the, one of the interesting things, I think, is uh, in the book of James, uh, uh, he talks uh, about the, uh, the tongue. And, and we were talking about this on Friday night in the Young Adults. And he says, you know, it's amazing this, the power that the tongue has. And he goes on to say, he says, you know, out of it we bless God and we curse man who are made in the image of God. So there's something to be said about the importance of God's relationship to man and you and I as, how, as far as how do we treat them. God has put each and every one of us here at this time together for a purpose. And to think, God knows in the grand scheme of things, the great and master plan, so that he knows, hey man, this world's got some 7 billion people living on it. They're going to have to learn how to interact with each other some point, somehow. 
He's forced us, like Pastor Paul was talking about last week, to get out of our comfort zone, to move past that discomfort. Why? Because no matter where you go, you're going to deal with people. So you have a decision right off the bat to understand, to come to the knowledge that, hey, listen, what do I want to do? Do I want to represent my God well or do I want to represent myself? Because I'm going to show where my loyalty is to myself or to my God. And when I show that I love people, because guess what? No matter what you do, you can't escape them. Even if you wanted to go live at the very tallest point, the very highest point in the world, on the tip of Mount Everest and set up a tent and have your oxygen tanks brought up, you still would come into contact with man. You can't go anywhere where you can't escape man. So therefore, you have a decision to make every day. You're going to come into contact with people. So you have a decision whether you can love them or you can love yourself. You can love them, you can hate them, you can bless them, you can curse them. The decision is yours. And what you do reflects your relationship with God. Why? Because God is love. We are of God. Therefore, we should love others. Amen. Going back to, to Matthew, I love this uh, illustration that Jesus gives. As a matter of fact, when we are the old building, the teal building, as we refer to it, this was painted or transcribed on a wall. And I believe it really puts the uh, essence of, of God's heart to his people. Matthew 25th chapter, 34th verse. Jesus is speaking. He says, then the king will come to those. Earlier he says that the king will come and he'll divide to his right and to his left. And the king will come to those on his right hand. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Viable, legitimate question. Here they're saying, God, Jesus is referring to the king. God, he says, listen, come and, 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 and welcome into my kingdom that I have prepared for you because you have done all these things on my behalf. And then they say, wait a minute. I, Jesus, you're talking out of my realm. You're talking out of my understanding. When have we seen you naked? When have we seen God who needed anything? The king, the, 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 the ruler of all, hungry or thirsty or in prison. And they come and Jesus says, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Church, we have got to understand that when we react to people, and he goes on to give the, the opposite of that example to his left hand, and he says, you did not feed me. You didn't clothe me. You didn't give me drink when I was thirsty. You didn't take care of me and visit me. And to you, you're out. You don't have a reward. You're cast out. And so we have got, to, have got to understand that Jesus is teaching us, his people, his followers, to say, listen, when we love the least of the people, those who don't deserve it most of all, when we reach out to those people, what we're truly doing is reflecting God in our lives and reflecting that we are loving God through loving his people, the least of his brethren. And when people frustrate you, when people make you mad, when people get you down and out, when you're on the freeway, understand that, think about that principle, the least of my brethren. Maybe that person doesn't deserve to be loved. Maybe that person did, did something to you that hurt you. Maybe that person did something that you'll never forget or never get over. But the bottom line is, as God says, when you do this to the least of my brethren, when you do this to those people that don't deserve it, you reflect it to me and you're basically doing it straight to me. Because it relates straight to you and I. Because when we love people, we love God. You guys with me? Talking about loving people. Praise God. To love people, number two, is to follow Christ. 
So first we see that to love people is to love our God, the greatest commandment, Jesus says. So we're reflecting the first commandment by following and operating in the second commandment. If you recall back in Matthew, Jesus says, it's not on the overhead today, but Jesus, after he says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he says, upon these two things hang all the law and the prophets. If you operate in love, you operate and what God has called for you and I. So to love, to, to love people is to love God. Secondly, to love people is now to follow Christ. To follow the example that Jesus Christ has led for us, that Jesus Christ has given to us, as Jesus Christ has done for us. In the book of John, in the 13th chapter, just turn a couple pages over in John, the 13th chapter. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. They've already uh, gone through the, the, the Last Supper. Judas has already dipped his hand in, the, in with the bread with Jesus. Judas has already departed on his way to sell Jesus out to the leaders of the Jews so that he might be turned over to the authorities and eventually crucified. Now Jesus goes and talks to the disciples right after he talked about that who, he who would betray him. And he brings the subject. Interesting time for him to talk about this. But he says, a new commandment, in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. When asked by the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And after that, just like it, is to love your neighbor as yourself. So wait a minute, why is it that after Jesus has, uh, has forecasted his betrayer, his betrayer has revealed himself and is now gone, and he's speaking to the 11 remaining disciples, he says to them, a new commandment I give to you, and then he follows with, you love one another. That's not a new commandment. That's the second great commandment that Jesus quoted earlier. So where do we pick up the words that follow? As I have loved you, that you also love one another. You see, verse number 35 goes on to say, By this we will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You see, to love your neighbor, to love one another, wasn't a new commandment. Because that was already said, that was already something placed in the law. But you know what? In the times of Jesus, much like the times that we live in right now, the thing that was in style, the thing that was popular to do was for vengeance, to get justice on yourself. If somebody did wrong to you, then you got them back. You sued them back. You took them back. You took justice and redeemed your name, redeemed your reputation. That was what was in style. That was the popular notion for that time. Much like it is today. Well, I'm looking out for number one. I'm looking out for myself. And I got to make sure that, you know, that if somebody does wrong to me, that I make sure that they know that they, that, that they did wrong to me and that I'm not going to take that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, they did that. I'm going to sue them or I'm going to do this and I'm going to cut them off. And they cut me off. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to get in front of them and I'm going to cut them off. Tell me that's not like what, what it is today. That's the world that we live in. So Jesus says, a new commandment, first and foremost. Why? Because I'm reintroducing something into your thought. Yeah, we heard you should love your neighbor as yourself. We've heard it. We've, we've, we've gone through our lives and said, oh, yeah, that's something that we should do. But now he says, listen to me. I want to reiterate this. I want to remind you. I want this to be new and fresh in your minds that no longer should you do what's in style. No longer should you do what everybody else is doing because that's just what human nature says. But now all of a sudden, I want this to be a new commandment to you. And so that you remember it as a new commandment and not as something of old like the Old Testament, I'm going to bring you a New Testament. And I'm going to give you an example. And he goes on to say that you love one another as I have loved you. So now all of a sudden, like I was talking about, how do we love people? You want to know how to love people? The questions that we say, well, Pastor Luke, this person's done this to me. This person's act like this to me. When I go and I smile at them, that's the reaction that I get back. What should I do? I don't know how to love people. Well, I'll tell you what. Back in the 90s, it was really popular. WWJD 
What would it now be? H-W-J-L. How would Jesus love? Okay, it's not as catchy. All right. <laughs> but we know the answer. Why? Because Jesus Christ has given us the example. It's no longer just a blanket statement. It's no longer just a, you should love people because that's what the law says. You should love people because that's what the Bible says you should do. Now he says, you should love people. Why? Because I have loved you. You should love people how I have loved you. You should use me as an example. I love the fact that on Wednesday night, Pastor Jim talked about a leper that came and fell on his face in front of Jesus and said, Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. And Pastor Jim used the example that a leper in those times, it was contagious. You didn't touch them. They wrapped themselves. They were in colonies on the outskirts, on the, on the, in, the, in the wilderness of the towns that you couldn't go near. When they came near, they had to make it known that they were lepers because it was illegal for them to be out and about. And so here this leper falls at the feet of Jesus and says, you can heal me. And Jesus, as we saw this morning through Pastor Jim's message with a, with a Roman centurion, the Roman centurion said to Jesus, listen, I know you don't got to go and touch my, my servant who's paralyzed. You can just say it, and the authority that you carry, he'll be healed. And the Bible tells us that Jesus marveled. Look at this man's faith. But then all of a sudden, this leper comes to Jesus at his feet and says, you can heal me. And what does Jesus do? He reaches out, the Bible says in Luke, and he touches him. He does what nobody else would do. He touches him. He touches that what's forbidden to touch. He touches that what is dangerous to touch. He touches that what everybody else says is unclean. He touches that what everybody else says is that's the one. Nobody can do anything for him. Nobody can touch them. Nobody can love them. They're on their own. And he reaches out and he touches them. He could have just said, you're healed. But he touched them. He made a relationship. He wanted him to know it's not just about the power that's in me, but the love. And all those around to see, listen. You've got to reach out to those people that you don't even think that you can touch. You've got to reach out to those people that, that you don't think are worthy. You've got to reach out to those people that cut you off, that spit in your face. You've got to do all these things. Why? Because Jesus Christ showed us that that is what to do. That is the way to live. That is how we ought to be. I love uh, Mother Teresa. We have a, a, a statement in our, in our, in our hallway it says, if you can't touch 100 people, start with one. You know, sometimes we don't know what to do because we don't know where to start. Start somewhere. Start with when you drive out and you see that person or that person cuts you off right here in the parking lot. Start somewhere. Start with one. At work, that person that just can't stop talking gossip about everybody else, start with one. Start to love those people that, that are the lowest of the lows, the least of the brethren, like Jesus says. Are you with me? In Ephesians, I'll just go ahead and pop it up on the overhead. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Paul's writings to the church says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given us and given himself for us as an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. To walk in love as Christ has loved us. To remember as we walk and we go about our day, we do whatever it is that we go through, to love people First and foremost is to love God, but to love people is to follow Christ, to follow the example that Jesus Christ has given us. He didn't just give you a blanket statement. He showed you how to love. That's why Paul says, you've been taught. You know this. We're talking about to love people. Are you with me tonight? Yeah. You still here? Yeah. To love people, number three tonight, is to sacrifice. To love people is to sacrifice. If you recall back in Matthew, the 27, 22nd chapter, Jesus says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, human nature, as well as nature's nature for that, or all creation in nature for that matter, is designed to look out for yourself. To, 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 for self-preservation, for self-betterment, for self-growth. self, for self uh, growth. You feed yourself, you clothe yourself, you bathe yourself, you lavish yourself, you, you, you treat yourself. That's what we do because we want our bodies, we want ourselves to be healthy, to be strong, to be fit, to do whatever it is, to, to be happy. Whether you may look in the mirror and say, I can't stand myself, yet you still put food in your mouth. 
You still take a shower, hopefully. You still have a job or, or work or do something so that you can have a roof over your head or live somewhere to provide shelter for yourself. Why? Because nature says to go after yourself, to preserve for yourself. That's the, the law of nature. When you look at animals, I've got two dogs. When I give one dog a bone and I give the other dog a bone, the dog that got the, 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 dog that got the second bone, the dog that got the first bone will come and take that bone. Because it's, they want what's best. They, want, they don't remember what they've already got. They want more, 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 more. That's us. As, that's human nature. That's, just, that's creation in general. To look out for ourselves. So then to love somebody else as though we love ourselves takes sacrifice. Why? Because we have got to shed what comes natural to us in order to do that to somebody else. Because like I was just using the example of my two dogs... That's just natural. It's natural for us to preserve ourselves. Well, you hurt me. You gave me a dirty look. You cut me off. You said this to me. You took my money. You took my coat. Whatever it might be, like Jesus said. Give him your other coat. That's not natural. To when somebody says, when somebody slaps you, you know, we all heard it, the problem, to turn the other cheek. That's not natural. When somebody slaps you, you want to slap them back. That's nature. But Jesus says, the Bible tells us, the word of God says, you know what? To love your neighbor as yourself takes sacrifice because you have to remove yourself from the equation and put, do what you would do to yourself, to that person. Well, what is that? To, like Jesus said in Matthew, to feed them, to clothe them, to give them water, when they, to give them the basic necessities, to comfort them, uh, to, 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 to be upon them, when, to, to, to share the love of God with them, whatever it might be, to love that person. To do what you would do to yourself to do to that person. Well, hey, that's not natural. I'll tell you that right now. So to love people is sacrifice. You with me? Tough one, but necessary. In the book of John, a couple pages over, if you're still in John, in the 15th chapter. Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the 12th, chapter, 12th verse, 15th chapter. This is my commandment. Again, reiterating what he's already told them. To, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Talking of himself and what he's going to do for the sake of mankind. To love and to follow in the suit of what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. To lay his life down. There is no greater example of love than that. So does that mean to love means to be sacrificed? Does that mean, Pastor Luke, i got to go build some rocks out in my front yard, throw some sticks on there, lay myself on the altar and say, well, I love people. So I'll sacrifice my life. No. But maybe you need to sacrifice your will and your desires. Maybe you need to sacrifice the things that you want. Maybe you need to sacrifice a dollar or two dollars in your billfold or your wallet for the betterment of somebody else who's in need. Maybe you need to reach out to people and give of yourself rather than just receive to yourself. To lavish, to feed, to clothe your own self, but to reach out to those who are hurting and those who are needy. To those that, not just physically, but spiritually. We're not just talking about those that don't have roofs over their head out behind the bridges today. We're talking about all those, not just in San Bernardino like we talked about, but all over the world to reach out to love people, to sacrifice our own self, our own comfort, our own desires for that day. Maybe God has got you, you got something you just can't wait to do. And you're going out and all of a sudden the Lord says something to you and says, why don't you do this with this person today? Oh, man, that ruins the rest of my day. Well, why don't you lay down your life for a day for the sake of somebody else to love, to sacrifice so that that person is built up? We have to start somewhere to love people is to sacrifice. Are you with me? In Luke, the 10th chapter, the 33rd through 37th verse is the story of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Interestingly enough about this parable is it's in reference to this question that Jesus has asked. And he says, they say, what's, well, you say Jesus, somebody comes to Jesus and says, well, you say that to love my neighbor as myself. Well, who's my neighbor, Jesus? I don't understand. Does that mean I'm to love this guy, not this guy, and this and this? And so the question is asked. So Jesus responds in the form of a parable, in the form of a story. 
It's a well-known parable, but if you're not sure, if you don't remember what it is, I'm just going to narrate the first part of it. A man is out on a road, and he's robbed. The robbers take everything he's got and leave him busted up, left for dead, and he's now on the road, desolate. And a priest comes by and sees the man on the road in need and ignores him. A Levite comes by and, and sees the man on the road, passes to the other side of the road and says, Oof, that guy's got some issues. Whatever he did probably, you know, the steps that he took probably led him to that place, so it's on him. And walked past. And then all of a sudden a Samaritan saw him on the road. Now Samaritans, back in the, in the days of Jesus, a Samaritan was not a Jew. A Samaritan was not a Gentile or anybody who was not a Jew. They were like the nobodies. They were the ones that nobody liked. Nobody wanted to acknowledge him. So Jesus uses the example of the outcast. And he says, now a Samaritan sees this man. In the 33rd verse, he says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, speaking of the man that was robbed. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. So not only did he stop wherever he was venturing to, and he shifted his course, changed his plans, you know, pulled out his iPhone or his Blackberry and said, cancel my appointments for the day. But now all of a sudden he got off his own animal and he put this broken, desolate man who was in need of help on his own animal. And he sacrificed his own self for this man. And he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. Verse number 35 goes on to say, And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. He gave them to the innkeeper and he said to take him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you even more. Verse 36 goes on to say, So which of these, Jesus asks the man who asked him, who's my neighbor? Which of these do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? In verse 37, the man goes and answers. He says, yeah, to he who showed him mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. It was a story, it was an illustration, it was a parable. But now he says, go and do likewise. Go and, and, and forget whatever you may need that you think that's important and give and to love and to invest and to sow into those people that are needy and to hurt and, to, and broken. Whatever it might take. Maybe it is just a smile. Maybe it is just to share the love of God with somebody. Maybe it is just to wave at them. Whatever it might be, to go and do it. And to not withdraw and not be like the priest. Not be like the Levite. To walk on the other side of the road and ignore them and say, well, wherever they, you know, the, where they're at, that, they got there because of their own problems. It's not my problem, but to share the love of God with them. Go and do likewise, Jesus says. Are you with me tonight? Last for... This evening, to love people, number four, to love people is to be sincere. To love people is to be sincere. You know, fake love gets us nowhere. And it's, it's interesting because you can tell when somebody's not real. You can tell when somebody's smiling through their teeth. Mm. You can tell when somebody's going through the motions. You can tell when somebody's just acting as if that's just because that's what the word says or maybe that's just because that's how Christians are supposed to act versus when it's really embedded into somebody's heart, when it's really embedded into somebody's soul, when it's really embedded that people are important whether we think so or not, when we have the heart inside, when we have the motive inside, not because somebody's watching not because we're, you know, we're over here and, and somebody from the church is watching what we're doing. Not because they know who we are, but because inside it's what God has put inside of us. And there's nothing that we can do but to live as an example to God. There's nothing more that we can do than to be what God has asked us to do. And to reach out and to be faithful, to show our love for our God like the first point we talked about today was. To be sincere, to make it heartfelt, to not just go through the motions. In Romans, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number 9, he says, Paul the Apostle writing, says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Kind of an obvious statement. Don't say that you love somebody and then talk behind their backs. Don't say, I love you, and pull them down. 
Do what you can to bring them down. But he says, let love be without hypocrisy. I like what the New Living Translation says. Makes it a little easier for us to understand. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. It's right off the bat. To love people is to be sincere. God's not after our emotions. He's not after our external actions. He's not after us playing the game or acting the part. He's after the transformation from within that reflects on the outside. All throughout John the 15th chapter, Jesus Christ talks about going and bearing fruit. That God would be glorified. Why? That we would go and bear much fruit. The fruit is what comes from on the inside. And we may act and we may go through the motions here and there and, and see somebody or, or love on somebody even when we may not want to. But then there's those times when nobody's looking or when there's those times when we don't think that anybody's paying attention and we say something. We let the word slip. We're all guilty of that. Because we're going through the motions and in, and in time, as time progresses, our true self will be revealed. And our true self could be somebody that is based on works on the outside only that makes a proclamation but doesn't back it up from the inside and eventually on the inside will be rotten away and what will, what, what's on the inside will show or because of the inside, because of the transformation that's within us, because of the love of Jesus Christ in our lives, because of the gift of our God who sent us his son Jesus Christ to love us, to save us, to redeem us from our sins, to show us the example of how we might love in our gratitude for our God, to bear fruit now all of a sudden out of the inside of our heart comes out what's in our treasure. Our treasure is what God loves is what we love. God loves people, so we love people. And it's a sincere action. It's not just emotions. It's not just doing it because it's socially acceptable. It's doing it because God wants us to. It's doing it because God's asked us to. It's doing it because God's commanded us to. It's easy to love nice people. It's easy to love the people on the bulletin because they're all happy. They're all smiling. They're all having a good time. You want to get in on that group and jump in on that picture. It's easy to love nice people. But with sincerity, when, it, when, when, it, when the rubber meets the road is when sincerity jumps in. Is when how do you love the people that don't love you back? God faces that every day. How many people have accepted God? Millions. Billions. But how much of them, or of the other side, have rejected God. Spit in his face, metaphorically speaking. Turned their back from him. Cursed at him. Made fun of him. Ridiculed him. Said that it's a crutch. Said that science disproves it. Yet, the Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, while the world rejected God, he still sent Jesus Christ to die for us. Why? Because of his love. The sincerity in his heart towards us, his people. Therefore, why shouldn't we reflect that sincerity that he showed us in our lives to those around us. Are you with me? Deep, deep, deep. And hard. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I'm perfect. This is tough. This is real world stuff. And you got to take it one day at a time like I was talking about Mother Teresa. You may mess up. But well, don't let that be the reason that you stop because you failed with one person. You keep going on. And you do the best you can from the inside out to love people. This is real world stuff, guys. This is probably love to me. I'm, my family will tell you the truth. I'm an I'm a introverted person. I like to hang out with my wife, Stacy, on the front row, and that's about it. I like to go on vacation alone. I like to go do my things alone. So I'm not naturally inclined to be around people. So it's a work for me. So I'm just telling you open and honest that this for me too is tough. As I'm writing this down, I'm like, man, Lord. Why do I have to teach this message? <laughs> Let Pastor Dan teach this one. But it's real world stuff. It's stuff that we have to hear. It's things that we have to get inside of us. And it's things that we have to understand that it's not just about going through the motions. It's not just about saying that we love people because we're in church on Sunday and then Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday we're doing what we're really doing. But to make it from the inside out. You with me? One last verse, and we'll, I'm just going to pop it up on the overhead. John, the third chapter, verse 18. First John, third chapter, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, an example I was thinking of is in, in the book of First Chronicles. David, 
King David gets himself in trouble. He starts to number Israel. God told him not to do that. And he, he, he was insecure at the time, so he, he calls a census. He wants to know who's, who's behind him, who's got his back. So he faces himself in between a rock and a hard place. He's, he's got the judgment of God coming upon him. And so he, he goes to make an altar for, of, of peace and make a sacrifice of peace. And he goes along and he sees this man. And this man is in his field and he's with his sons. And they're threshing and doing their wheat thing. And, and David comes upon him and, the, and there's this angel with a sword with David. And the man and his son see the angel, and the sons go and run. They're like, holy cow, I'm getting out of here. And the man continues to work, and David says, hey, can I use this ground to build, a, to build an altar of sacrifice to God? And the man says, you're the king. Here's, dude, here's the land. I got all this wheat. I got all the wood. I got the stone. I got everything for you to make an altar. Let's build it. He says, I even got the calf. Or I got the ox for you. We'll cut it up. Do it. David says, let me pay for it. God says, no, 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 man, no, 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 no. David says, the sincere heart of David, the sincere heart of the king, the man who the Bible refers to as the man after God's own heart, says, no, I will never give to God anything that cost me nothing. That's sincerity in heart. So when we try to love people, we love people that are easy to love. It costs us nothing. When we love the people that are on the cover of the bulletin, it's easy. It doesn't cost us anything. But how about loving, like Jesus said in this parable, the least of his brethren? Those that need it, like the leper that he reached out and touched. The ones that cost us our reputation. The ones that cost us our comfort. The ones that cost us our time and our effort. The ones that cost us our emotion. To be sincere in heart and to love. He says, let us not love just out of our, our actions. Let us not just say we love, but let's do it in deed and in truth, and truth being sincerity. Did you guys get something out of the word today? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, listen, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to see whether or not you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. You know, it'd be a tragedy for us to have a message tonight, to have some praise and worship, to talk about the word of God and to just leave without asking you this question and having each and every one of you in this place examine yourself and examine your heart. I want to ask you this question. You know, nobody will know the answer except you and God. But I want to ask you this. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a simple question, but nobody would know the answer except between you and God. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So why don't we go over some of your answers that you might have had in this place? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I'm not sure I believe in hell. I'm not sure that I believe that heaven exists. So, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know. Well, you know what? Just because you don't believe that heaven exists or you don't believe that hell is real doesn't mean it's not. You know, that's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Maybe because you grew up in a place where you had never seen a semi-truck before in your life, yet you can go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway, and lo and behold, you'll meet one face to face. God thought it important enough to mention hell and heaven in the Bible. Jesus Christ thought it important enough to mention heaven and hell in the Bible. It is important enough for me to stand here and tell you the truth, to quit playing games just because you think it may not be real doesn't mean it's not. It's a very real place. Well, you know, Pastor Luke, I think I'd get to heaven. I hope I'd get to heaven. I really want to get there. I really hope I do. Can you show me in the word of God where it says it because you think that you're going to get to heaven? Because you hope that you're going to get to heaven. Like you have the most positive outlook on life. You genuinely desire to go. You really want to get there. Can you show me in the word of God where it says that, that you're going to find yourself in heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the word. Just because you think you're going to get to heaven. Just because you hope to get there. Just because you want to go to heaven doesn't mean that you're going to find your way into heaven. You know, but, but Pastor Luke, I wasn't raised as a, as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or anything else like that. So doesn't that mean by default that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion or philosophical thought for that matter, that because you don't fall into those categories, by default that means that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? Nowhere will you find it. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. You know, I don't cheat on my taxes. I've never robbed the, 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 the liquor store. You know, I, I even give to charitable organizations to, to help the, the relief effort in Haiti or to help fight AIDS in Africa. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Good people go to heaven. 
Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because of your good deeds, because you don't cheat on your taxes, because you don't, you've never robbed the liquor store, because you actually even give to help those who are in need, that you're going to get your way in heaven. Can you show me where it says that in the word of God? Nowhere will you find that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing we can do on our own will ever make us good enough to get into heaven. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to quit playing games and tell you the truth like it is. There's a lot of good people that are on their way to hell. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I was brought up in the church. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. You know, I attended church on Christmas and on Easter. I was baptized as a child or christened as a baby. You know, my parents told me all my life that I was a Christian. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that because your parents took you to church as a child, because you attended Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes, that you're going to find your way into heaven? Can you show me where it says that because somebody sprinkled water over you as a baby that you're going to get your way into heaven and that your sins have been absolved? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere in the Bible. Well, but Pastor, look, I call myself a Christian. I sit in church. I'm here tonight. Doesn't that, doesn't that count for something? Just because you give yourself a title, just because you've given yourself a name, doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. You know, that's like me going and sitting in my garage and calling myself a car. At no point in my life will I ever transform into a car just because I call myself that. Yet we believe because we call ourselves a Christian, because we give ourselves a name, that we're going to find ourselves in heaven. Well, listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. It's just not that way. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, I know of Jesus and of Jonah and of Moses and of David, Abraham. I know the stories of the Bible. I know about God and, and the devil and, and the demons and things of that nature. I know that stuff. I even know some memory verses. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Just because you know who Jesus is, just because you know about God and Moses and of Jonah and Abraham and David, doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. You know, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God and Jesus is, yet they're not going to get into heaven. So there's got to be something more to it than that. Oh, but Pastor Luke, I, was a, I, I, I attended my last church. I, I played in the music band. I, 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 I was an usher. I carried the pastor's Bible. I, I memorized memory verses. I grew up in, 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 in leadership in my church. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says it? Because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you were an usher in your last church, because you, you have memorized some memory verses, you've studied the Word of God, that you're going to get in heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere. As a matter of fact, in the book of John, in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and asks Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. Therefore, Nicodemus had dedicated his young life to studying and to memorizing the Scriptures. He, he said all the right things. He did all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. He, he could teach and, 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 and speak in the, in, the, in, the, in the pulpits of his church, the synagogue. He gave to the poor. He was a good person. And you would think that Jesus would come to Nicodemus and say, pat him on the back and say, man, Nicodemus, great job. You just keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven. But Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, you know what, Nicodemus? You must be born again. Well, what does born again mean? You know, Hollywood, popular culture, society, they've made such a mockery out of that term. We think of radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. But you know what? From the beginning of the Bible till the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your knowledge of him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Jesus Christ, speaking to the church in the book of Revelation, says, listen, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What Jesus Christ is saying is, listen, when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you hot, he better find you cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm, he will spit you out, he will cast you out, he will reject you out of the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what that means. Lukewarm means that you've been a little bit up, you've been a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out in your relationship with God. Maybe occasional church attendance here and again, token prayer, throw it out, throwing it out every once in a while. You got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You got too much of the world in you to enjoy God. You're riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, listen, 
And I come back, when it comes time to meet him face to face, he says, I better not find you in that condition, lukewarm, because if you are, you're deceived in thinking that you're going to get into heaven. But rather be cast out from the kingdom of heaven. So here's what I want to do in a moment. I want to give you the opportunity. If you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, all your life, you're not sure, you think, man, maybe did I do that as a kid? I don't know. Been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. In a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to know God with all of your heart, with all of your life. You say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate what you're doing. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get there the same. You know what? Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it God's way. Tonight, in this house, Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So you know what? Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it Jesus Christ's way because he's the only way that we can. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible. Make that noise just like that. And if that's you, if you've never given all your heart, all your life to Jesus Christ in a moment, we'll all do it at the same time when I smack my hands. I want you to pop your hand up. You know what you're doing when you're popping your hand up? You're saying, you know what? I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to surrender my life to him and let him be in control. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. He's not going to make his way in. You can't make the person next to you do it. Each and every one of you have got to make the decision on your own. Say, Pastor Luke, if I pop my hand, if I raise my hand, people are going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? I'm not going to embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed because you put your hand up, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of, of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So all across this auditorium, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing right now, if you're out there in the foyer watching this by TV, if that's you in this place, I'm going to count to three. And if you've never given all of your heart, you've never given all of your life to Jesus Christ, if you're not sure, don't leave this place tonight without making sure. The Bible tells us that we don't know what tomorrow holds. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, been running from God instead of to God, tonight, let's make it the night that you go forward for God. All across this auditorium, hands are getting ready to go up all at the same time. One, two, three. Go ahead and pop your hand up. Let me see it. One, two, don't clap. Three, four, five, six. Got you. If I saw you guys can put your hands down. Seven, eight, I got you. Eight wise people. Where are you, number nine? Where are you, number ten? Say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You should do this. Go and just pop your hand up so I can see. You can put it right back down if that's you. Nine, okay, I got you. Praise God, you're never too young. Where are you, number 10? Say, man, I wish this guy would shut up. I want to get out of here. Come on, pop your hand up. Where are you at? Let me see. If that's you in this place, say, man, I, just, I wish you just, I don't know. I'm just not sure. I don't know, think I can do it. Pop your hand up so I can see it. Let's move forward for today. Let's go forward with your relationship today. Number 10, where are you at in this place tonight? I know there's 10 of you. Well, praise God for nine wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ. You said you wanted to give him all of your heart, all your life. Let us pray with you. Let us help you. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. When I do, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your purse, your sweater, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, somebody next to you. And I want you to get out of your chair and get up here and meet me at the altar. Let us help you. Let us pray with you. So as we all stand, if that's you, if you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, you can come up right now. I want you to come and be bold. Meet me up here today. Come on. You can come. Come on. You can come. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. They're coming. Come on down. Come on down. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that come on down. I take. If that's you, if you put your hand up, come on down. Every moment I'm away. Lord, have we'll wait. your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on down. If that's you, if that's you, come on down. Well, hey guys, praise God. Today is a new day. I want to introduce a friend of you to my, a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. 
Man, I thought you might even think, man, Pastor, you pretty, nah, this, this is pretty cool. No, this guy is where it's at. He's the nicest guy I think you'll ever meet. Easy person to love. He's going to do something. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to pray a prayer with you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life. It's not about an abracadabra, magical word, but it's about your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff. Free stuff. A book our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Super easy reading. You can polish it off probably in a day. It's just something to give you, something to, to help build you up in the things of God so that you understand where you're coming from and where you're going. He's also, wants, he's also going to do something. He's going to introduce to you a spiritual personal trainer. Like when you go to the gym and you see a personal trainer, people help you build those muscles and eat the right food so that you get strong and get fit. We're going to introduce to you a spiritual personal trainer, a friend, somebody that will meet you right before service, teach you some things for five weeks, five times, and they'll just teach you for 15 minutes, grab, get you, grab a hold of you, make sure that you're doing what God's called you to do, get strong in the things of God so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, right over there, go with Pastor Dave.